Hey ladies and gentlemen, this uh, video is going to be focused primarily on the back two-thirds of the notes, not the front one-third, because we did that in class together, but where I ended up in my A day and my B day is not exactly the same, so when I get to that edge, you may see me slow down. So, uh, this whole chapter is about solutions and about, uh, you know, how we mix things together, what molarity is, when things dissolve, what is solubility. Uh, here are the key terms we talked about at the beginning of class. Make sure you know them all. Talked about the difference between dissolving, uh, how dissolving actually involves um, things uh, breaking apart, which requires energy, spreading apart the solvent, which requires energy, and then when they come together, when they come together and bond, there's a release of energy. So that's one of the things we hit on in the very beginning. Uh, we talked about a like dissolves like is not a good enough answer. You actually have to say, hey, this is polar, and it will dissolve things that are polar, and this molecule is, this molecule is, ergo, boom. You have to go through those explanations. Don't ever just say like dissolves like. You actually have to tell us what is polar, what is nonpolar. Um, <clears throat> then we talked about how uh, soap is kind of cool because one end is nonpolar, I just circled the wrong end. One end is polar and the other end is nonpolar. And because both ends are attached in one molecule, it has the ability to dissolve things, whether they're polar or nonpolar, because the two tails of the soap molecules can work as a team. Um, I don't know if I said this in, in both classes, but it's also similar to the cellular membrane yeah, the cellular membrane or the bilayer phospholipid membrane, biphospho, phospho bilipid. I can't quite remember the right term, but it's similar to this, where the the there's one layer that's polar, then there's the nonpolar layer, another nonpolar layer, and then one layer that's polar. And so it's got two pieces to it also, uh, with them meeting in the middle. And you talked about uh, ionic compounds and how they're soluble and what rules you need to know and don't need to know and how there's always like little clues in there to give you a hand um, the first two rules are really the most important rules and then you can usually figure out what's missing based off the rules uh, silver chloride is super common in our world that is always solid and barium sulfate is also pretty common in our world so i mentioned those in both classes that they're always solid what is, this, what is the difference between dissolving an ionic compound and dissolving a molecule? Ionic compounds break apart when they dissolve in water. Um, molecules don't, they stay as molecules. Um, and so when this iron chloride dissolves, it breaks apart based on the ratio of the ions in there. There's one iron, so there's one iron, there's three chlorines, so there's three chlorines. And it based up, breaks down based off the ratio of the ions. Here we work through, we talked about whether or not something would dissolve in the substance. Yeses were because they would dissolve, they are miscible. Miscible means they will make a homogeneous solution. And since sodium nitrate's an ionic compound, it will dissolve in water. But because it's an ionic compound, it won't dissolve in hexane. So it's the whole like dissolves like, and you have to kind of go through and work them out. There are a couple of surprise no's on there, like silver chloride was one of those exceptions we talked about that's always a solid, even in water, it just doesn't dissolve. It's, its forces are too strong for water to dissolve. Solutions, uh, there's the solvent and the solute. You need to know the difference between the two. The solute is the smaller thing. The solvent is the larger thing. Um, I used to think that the solute was what you added to the water, which was the solvent, but that's a little too generic and sometimes isn't true, so don't use that mnemonic device. Um, and then we just had some examples of solvents and solutes. Calculating molarity. Remember, it's moles per liter. You have to convert to moles using the molar mass and then divide by the volume, bam, bam, or strike that, reverse it. Here we're talking about whether or not molarity, how molarity is impacted on the individual ions. Since this compound breaks apart into one calcium and two uh, OCLs, which is hypochlorite, then the molarities would not be equal. 
the molarity of calcium versus the molarity of hypochlorite, hypochlorite would be twice the molarity. This is the molarity for the compound, but the compound doesn't really stay together. It splits apart, so it shouldn't really be written as that. So we've got to think about how those individual pieces are in there. And then here we have them uh, you know, calculating if I have a mass and I calculate the molarity of a particular ion. It took a minute to uh, discuss making a solution. And I'm going to, let's see, I need to remove my face from the camera. Okay, so when we make a solution from a solid, there are a couple of steps. The first step is do the calculations and get all your equipment in ready. Uh, you need your clean solid, you need distilled water, distilled water, not tap water. Tap water has stuff dissolved in it. You want distilled water, which is just good old H2O, uh, a beaker, a funnel, a wash bottle, and then uh, a volumetric flask. So you have your empty beaker, you mass the empty beaker, then you put in the right amount of solid, whatever you've calculated. Uh, then you're supposed to put that solid into your volumetric flask. A volumetric flask like this one uh, is for a set volume and has a line on it and that line is called the calibration mark and the volumetric flask is really good at that volume. Usually it's like four or five, six sig figs at that volume. So it's really precise. And you put your solid into there. Most of the time you don't have any trouble. You just pour the solid in, bam, you're done. Uh, it's always a good idea to make, all, make sure all of the solid got in there. Sometimes the solid sticks to the beaker or sticks to your weigh tray or whatever. Um, and the easiest way to get it off is to rinse it off. And so when I make a solution and there's still a little bit of solid left over, I'll put a little bit of water in the beaker and then pour the water over. Then I'll put a little bit more water in the beaker and pour the water over. Then I'll put a little bit more water in the beaker and pour it over. I usually do it three times. And that way those tiny little crystals that got left behind dissolve into that first bit of water and I pour it over. Now there might be like a drop of water left over that has a little bit in, in it. Well, I dissolve that into some water and then I pour it over. Now I might have a drop of a drop left over. Now we're talking about a really tiny amount left over, which I then dissolve into some more water and pour over. So I make sure that the only thing that could be left behind in the beaker is a drop of a drop of a drop of a crystal, which is to say practically nothing. Um, and so I just give it a quick rinse, like a tablespoon of water, pour it over. A tablespoon of water, pour it, you know, a quick rinse just to get those last little crystals into the volumetric flask. And then once you've got all the solid in the flask, you fill the flask up to the calibration mark, right to that calibration mark, which you can see has been done here. Now, sometimes the solid is very soluble and just dissolves, and you can just give a quick swirl. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, you put the cap on uh, a volumetric flask and you can really swirl the heck out of it without having to worry about it splashing or anything like that. Um, when it dissolves, sometimes air bubbles come out of the water and you have to take the cap off and refill it to the calibration line. That's not uncommon. When it dissolves, it'll sometimes push air right out of the water. You need to fill it back up to the line. And if you're worried about it not being stirred well enough, as long as the calibration mark is matched with the water line, you can add a magnetic stir bar and then spin it like crazy to get it all dissolved. Then we did a calculation. This is usually called the dilution equation, where you have one uh, solution that you need to take a small amount of and then dilute that small amount down. And the equation is molarity times volume equals molarity times volume. Because molarity times volume is equal to moles, the amount of moles are not going to change. You're just spreading them out. So you're going to have a small amount of moles you add a lot of water to and spread them out. You're diluting them. And so here we're doing the calculation. It looks like there's 15 milliliters of the strong acid needed and very little of the water. I mean, a whole lot of water needed. Now, you notice it says around 100 and, uh, 585. And that's because when you mix things, sometimes they expand or contract. Sometimes when water meets hydrochloric acid, it expands. 
sometimes it meets uh, a different compound and it contracts. And so you might have to use a little bit more or a little bit less than 585, which is why we have that volumetric flask with a calibration line on it. So you fill it right up to that calibration line. Ooh, look at this amazing water being poured into here. And you fill it right to that calibration line and you know what the volume is. Now, if you're dealing with strong acid dilution, there are some steps. And so I went over the steps for solid uh, dilution a second ago, or solid solution creation. Uh, here we have creating a solution from a solution where you have your uh, volumetric flask that is the appropriate volume. Let's just pretend this one was 600 milliliters right there at the line, which is a pretty weird value for a volumetric. They're not usually 600. Um, and we need to put everything in this flask. Now the order makes a huge difference with acids because acids, acids are very exothermic when they get dissolved. So we typically put a lot of the water in and here I said 500 mils, that's not 500, but it's a lot. And then put the acid in and then put the rest of the water in and then stir and that way there is plenty of water for the acid to mix in with and if it's exothermic there's plenty of places for that energy to go so it goes water acid the last of the water mix 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 and this should say 585 mils like the previous slide okay uh, what's happening when we dissolve things? When we dissolve things, the ions are being attracted to the water molecules and they're breaking them apart. And you can see that this uh, anion here is surrounded by six water molecules. And since it's an anion with a positive, scratch that, it's an anion with a negative charge, the hydrogen atoms are attaching to the anion. And then down here in the cation, the oxygen atoms are connecting to the cation. Uh, what type of interaction are we seeing there? Well, we're seeing ion dipole interactions, the cation to the oxygen, the anion to the hydrogen. Uh, show an interaction between water molecules and CH2Cl2. Well, let's draw CH2Cl2, CHHCl. CL, boom, 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 boom. There we go. I'm going to guess that this is the positive side and this is the negative side of CH2Cl2 because I know chlorine is more electronegative than hydrogen, so chlorine would pull electrons to it. So this molecule might be attracted to a water molecule and the hydrogen and the water molecule would form a bond, a weak bond, a dipole-dipole bond to that other molecule. Not a hydrogen bond because that is not one of the funny elements we've talked about in the past. So it can't make a hydrogen bond to it. On the other side, yeah, you could have, oops, that's yellow. You could have an oxygen from the water molecule bonding to it. And again, that can't be a hydrogen bond. That, that bond here, that is not a hydrogen bond because the hydrogen is between oxygen and carbon. And the hydrogen in a hydrogen bond has to be between oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen, right? The hydrogen in a hydrogen bond must be trapped between one of those fun elements. Uh, and then we have CH3OH, and because this has OH on it, it can do hydrogen bonding. So you could have a hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and there could be a weak bond. Shouldn't have used green because that's the color I was just drawing in. Let's pick purple. So there could be a weak bond between the oxygen and that hydrogen, and that hydrogen would be trapped in between the two oxygens. 
Draw a particulate diagram showing uh, three formula units for MgCl2. So MgCl2 is going to break apart into Mg, Mg, Mg. That is three Mgs. How many Cl2 should be in there? How many Cl should be in there? There we go. That's good enough. Maybe I made it too big. There's three magnesiums and six chlorines. Hey, I'm not the best at drawing MgCl2 a bunch of times. It's totally okay to say this equals Mg plus 2 and dot equals Cl2. And then you could have drawn, you know, oops, I changed colors. That would have worked also, all right? As long as you show that they're spread out afterwards. Um, first question you're really supposed to ask yourself on any of these drawings is, is it soluble? Will it dissociate? Will it dissociate or will it dissolve? Um, and remember, ionic compounds dissociate. They break apart uh, where uh, the others don't. So the calcium chloride is going to have one calcium and two chlorines separating, floating around because calcium chloride is soluble. Uh, iron nitrate is soluble. You'd have one iron in the beaker, and you'd have three nitrates all floating around separately. Make sure you show the charge. It says two formula units. I really should have drawn everything there twice. So two irons and six nitrates, two calciums, and four chlorines. This one, though, Let's draw this one. Okay, so we got our beaker. We have the solution, which I didn't even draw a solution in the last two, like a, like a water line. But uh, how should we draw that if it's a solid? Well, one formula unit, two formula units, and three formula units. We write the formula three times in a group. Maybe we even go to try to, like, indicate that they are together as one thing because they're a solid. So what the heck is an electrolyte? An electrolyte is something that dissolves very well in water and makes the water able to conduct electricity, thus the electrolyte part. Uh, strong electrolytes are things that dissolve well in water. So if we said it was soluble, like our solubility rules, like the group ones and the nitrates and the acetates that are very soluble, those are going to be strong electrolytes, as are the strong acids and bases we talk about in just a second. Weak electrolytes. Weak electrolytes kind of dissolve in water, but not very well. If it's an acid, but it's not one of the strong acids we talk about, it's a weak acid. There's two categories, strong and weak. You need to know these four strong if it's not one of those four strong, it's considered weak. Okay? Yeah, that's... If it's not one of those four strong, it's considered weak. And, and so we don't have to actually know the weak acids. We just kind of go, no, 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 must be a weak acid. So if you see any acid, let's... Here we go, write one down. HMNO4. Is that going to be strong or weak? Well... HMNO4 is not one of these four acids, so it's going to be weak. So it doesn't dissolve very well in water, and it doesn't conduct electricity very well. Cool? The strong bases are listed there, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, any other group 1 hydroxide, and NH2-1. That's the last of them. Uh, decide if these would be strong or weak electrolytes. Uh, HClO4 is a strong acid, so this would be a strong electrolyte. NH3, um, nope, not a strong base or a strong acid, not a strong electrolyte. C, it might, you know, it's a weak electrolyte. It is ionic, though. It will react. C6H12 is a molecule, so that is a non-electrolyte. CaCl2 is uh blah, blah 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 it is a strong electrolyte calcium chloride dissolves very well that's a group one hydroxide strong base 
And then this is a weak acid, so it's a weak electrolyte. And then th this question here kind of has an issue. Um, the whole soluble, insoluble thing, you really just you should be able to pick out this one's soluble, this one's soluble, this one's soluble, that one's soluble, based off of what's in there, nitrate, lithium, sodium, ammonium. The other ones... Uh, if you don't know whether barium sulfate's a solid or not, the question will say there's a solid and you'll eliminate. So if you had, if your choices were lithium carbonate and barium sulfate, one of them's got to be a solid. Well, you know lithium carbonate must be aqueous because lithium's group one, it's always aqueous. Ergo, must be barium sulfate, that's the solid. And that's the sort of logic that'll hit with this. Okay, so uh, switching gears. Uh, separating mixtures. There's a couple common ways. There's distillation, there's filtration, and chromatography. Filtration is not really addressed in here. Filtration, you have a solid and a liquid and you just catch it in the paper and the liquid keeps going through and etc. Um, but chromatography and distillation, these are more exciting because they do deal with the intermolecular forces um, between them. Give me a second here. All right, I'm hoping that worked okay. I, I had to go check on some things to make sure I knew what was coming up. So uh, we're going to talk about chromatography first, and then we'll come back to distillation. So chromatography, um, you have a mixture, and you're separating it, just like all of these other things. Um, and there's a couple of different types of chromatography. And, and the term chromatography actually harkens back to the beginning of chromatography. In the old days, you would separate uh, mixtures and you would actually see these different pigments. Um, and that's what we have. The original chromatography experiment idea here is we have this glass column with calcium carbonate or limestone or chalk or whatever. It's powdered. It's ground up. And you would put the sample on the end. And then you would pass water through it. And the water, as it goes through, is going to go th through, right? Water's going to go right through the column, and as it goes down the column, those pigments that are in your sample, in this case they were leaf pigments, those pigments would get spread out, and you'd get, you know, red, green, chlorophyll was a big hit, you know, in leaves you'd get a lot of green um, in one area, and the other bands would be a lot smaller. This picture is a little bit exaggerated. It should be a larger green band because there's so much chlorophyll in most leaves. And you could separate the different pigments that were in there. And the reason they were separating was twofold. One, how attracted are they to water? As the water goes by, it's grabbing the pigments and pulling them along. And if the attraction is strong, it's going to pull them strong. So if the intermolecular forces are strong with each other, together, they're going to pull really well. So maybe hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonding, come with me, okay? But at the same time, there's the calcium carbonate. And the pigment is moving through the calcium carbonate. It's attracted to the calcium carbonate, which is slowing it down. You know, it's like, it's like grabbing on, it's like, no, I've got to hold on. It's holding on, and it's slowing it down. So if the pigment is really attracted to the calcium carbonate, it's going to move slower. If it's attracted to the water, it's going to move faster. Okay? So two situations there. If it's not attracted to the calcium carbonate and it's attracted to the water, it's going to move really fast. That is probably this red band down here. Not attracted to the calcium carbonate, very attracted to the water, so it moved the farthest. Whereas the orange band near the top, an orange band not very attracted to the water, very attracted to the calcium carbonate, didn't move very far. And so you get this separation based off of those two primary things. Shocker. The thing that's moving is called the mobile phase. That would be the water or whatever solvent you're using that's moving through it, mobile phase. 
The thing that's not moving, like the calcium carbonate, that is stationary, it is the stationary phase. Okay? Uh, here's some other examples of paper chromatography where they put like a little dot of ink here, put a little dot of ink, and then they put it down in a liquid, and as the liquid moves up the paper, it pulls the ink apart as it goes up. Here's another version of chromatography, which we're not going to pause. It's the exact same idea again and again, is how far is it moving? And people actually measure the ratio of how far things move. Um, but pretty much all we need to know how to, is that the, the farther it moves, as, it, as it's moving, in this case this is moving up, the farther it moves, the more it attracted it was to the solvent. As the solvent moved all the way up the paper, all the way to this solvent line, and that moved very far, so it was very attracted to the solvent. Okay, uh, this diagram shows the results of a thin layer chromatography. Uh, briefly describe uh, what you would have done in order to get to this stage. So this is a pretty common lab they do in middle school and in biology. We have done it in chemistry some years, some years we haven't. I don't remember if we did it the year you took chemistry. Um, but so again, that solvent, I'm going to choose green. The solvent is down here, all right? And you stick the paper in the solvent, and the solvent then climbs up the paper. Right? That's as far as it got. It got to that dashed line. And as it moves up the paper, it's going to spread apart whatever little drop of ink they put on there. So they put a drop of ink here, and it looks like it had a couple of different pigments in it. And you might not realize this, but your ink in a pen is actually a mixture of pigments. And as the solvent moves past the pigments, it's going to spread them out. Okay? Um, and notice they covered the beaker. They covered the beaker so that air doesn't disrupt anything, so that evaporation doesn't happen, and they really tried to make it a sealed chamber so that the liquid front would move faster. Um, this was actually a kind of a similar question to a couple years ago. Uh, amino acid M was tested. This is M and it was compared to five other known amino acids and that mixture obviously contains number five, number three, and number four and then it has a mystery one also, doesn't it? Ooh, that's exciting. So it's got three of the five and it's got a mystery one as it got separated. Um, and again, just real quick explanation, they put the unknown here and then the knowns across the way and then they drop it in the liquid and the liquid separates them out and then based how far they move you can go hey look this one and this one move the same distance they must be the same thing uh, this is uh, about the stationary phase about the part that's not moving um, and sometimes silica gel is used. That's this, right? It's the surface of silica gel. And uh, as the compounds move by it, because the silica gel has those hydroxides, it can make hydrogen bonding that will really slow down the polar molecules. But the nonpolar molecules will slide right past it. All right, moving to distillation. In distillation, you have a mixture. And let's just kind of point out that this is orange, which would be, you know, red and yellow. And then they heated it up. You know, they got the Bunsen burner going down here. Oh, Bunsen burners are usually blue and red. There we go. Let's get a little color in there. I know that Jocelyn really likes colors, and so does Matt. All right, so there we go. So we got a good old Bunsen burner heating up our liquid here. Look, it's a full-on Bunsen burner. Ooh, man, he's getting artistic. His thing there. Oh, there's a hose. Yay. All right, so that Bunsen burner is heating the liquid, and they're going to have different boiling points. Um, and let's just let's just ask, uh, Amid, what's the boiling point, say, for the orange one? 
I think it's 10. Okay, I mean, 10's pretty low, but we'll go with 10. Sure, all right. All right. And then um, what is the boiling point of the yellow one? Oh, the yellow one's five. Okay, these are really low boiling points, I mean, I'm not quite sure. Uh, but anyway, some liquids might be 10 and five. I don't know. So we heat them up. And because the yellow one, the yellow one, this is the yellow one, and this is the red one. Since the yellow one has a lower boiling point, it's going to boil first, and it's going to go up and then it's going to go through this cooling zone. That cooling zone is a tube of glass surrounded by a tube of glass, and the outer tube of glass is filled with cold water, which causes things to get cooled down, and then the cooled gas that travels through it turns back into a liquid. And distillation allows you to adjust the temperature. Now, normally, We'd like these temperatures we're trying to separate to be farther apart. Maybe we'll change that to 40. If the boiling points were 40 and 5, it would be pretty easy to separate these two. If they're close together, you have to really slowly heat it um, and, and keep it real slow going because you're going to accidentally kick some of the vapor over. You might have to distill it again and again. Suppose there's a solution that contains four different liquids that need to be separated using distillation based on the vapor pressures at 25 degrees Celsius. Explain the order. Okay, well, let's, let's explain what vapor pressure is again. So we have a beaker. Nice drawing. And in that beaker, there is a liquid. And, of course, this beaker is sealed. There we go. It's got a lid on it now that it's got this liquid in there. So some of this liquid is going to vaporize and become a gas and be flying around <coughs> and eventually its pressure is going to maximize and it's going to start to condense back in and so for every particle flying out you're going to have some particles flying back in until you reach an equilibrium vapor pressure for that liquid now this equilibrium vapor pressure is largely based upon intermolecular forces. The stronger the forces, the less likely the gas, the less likely the liquid is going to become a gas. Strong force stays a liquid. Weak force becomes a gas. So, uh, if it breaks apart a whole lot, it's going to have a higher vapor pressure. So as we can see, this molecule has the highest vapor pressure. It seems to be very easy to break apart. So it probably has a low boiling point because it's easy to vaporize. Bromine is in second place there, and then ethanol, and then water. And that should be a, make a lot of sense. Water has very strong intermolecular forces, so it's not going to vaporize very much. Okay, Whew. changing gears. In fact, I'm going to stop this video and make another one for the rest because I need to take a break.